My name is Jennifer and I'm the president of the Journalism Club here at UAM. On behalf of the Journalism Club, I would like, like to welcome y'all to the last lecture series. The last lecture offers a chance for a selected university employee to share their insights if it, as if it were to be their last lecture. This is not necessarily a retirement type speech and no UAM speaker has used it as such. The Journalism Club nominates the individual to speak. This year, we nominated Dr. Gary Marshall, but due to unforeseen circumstances, he was not able to be with us tonight. After going back to the drawing board, we chose Dr. Sidney, Associate Pro Professor of Journalism. We chose Sidney, as he is known to his students, because he has been an inspiration and a mentor to many of us. Sidney has been with UAM for nine years, but will be leaving us after this semester. In his time here, he has helped build the voice, UAM's online news source, to what it is today. He doesn't write or edit our work, he is just simply our advisor. After my time on The Voice, the only regret I have is not joining it sooner. Sid has definitely left his mark on this campus, and I only hope we can continue this tradition after he is gone. Sid is going to share with us his advice and wisdom this evening. So without further ado, Dr. Ronald Sid. <laughs> speak up a little bit. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, before I get to the lecture, I need to have some thank yous to, uh, just to let everyone know before, so we can go whenever I'm done. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank the Journalism Club for inviting me to speak. I uh, also want to give special recognition to Jennifer Lawrence and to Clint Bryce again, the programs that you have in front of you. Uh, they actually made for a class this semester, and um, I think they did a really great job with them. So, um, they have asked that you don't throw them away. If you plan to throw them away, they would like to recycle them instead. So uh, keep on word, recycle. Uh, thanks to all the Voice alumni who came out. I also had some calls from some who wanted to come, but they could not because of the weather. And I'm really happy with the turnout because of, or due to the weather. Just so you know, all the money that we end up making here tonight ends up going back into the Journalism Club so they can end up having uh, contest entries. Um, I need to give special thanks to those who've made my job as pleasant as possible. Ty Williams and David, Marilyn Shaw, Brenda Henderson can't be here tonight. They get in here about four o'clock in the morning. They're the ladies who have uh, kept my classrooms clean, kept it where I could actually get into my office. For those of y'all who have been to my office lately, you know that that's a challenge. So uh, special thanks to them. And they always say hello uh, whenever I actually uh, slept in my office the first semester I taught down here. Um, they were really nice about making sure that they knocked before coming in. So that's good. Uh, I need to thank uh, Amy Meeks, the Arts and Humanities Secretary. She can make the government efficient and still find time to read. And I also need to uh, thank my communication colleagues. Uh, those who would meet Dr. Linda Webster, Scott Kutenkuller, and Dr. Gary Marshall no longer teach speech. However, Jim Evans, Keith Milstead, Brian Jones have given us a great foundation everyone else is coming in after we leave. I need to thank Dr. Uh, Mark Spencer, not Dr. Spencer, but Mark Spencer, my dean, for his support, particularly when we merged journalism and speech. I need to thank all my friends from Arts and Humanities, especially those who've made it out tonight. Um, I guess if I tried to name everybody, we could be here for some time. However, I would be remiss not to thank the, uh, former provost David Ray, who brought me to UAM whenever I came back to Arkansas. He also gave the inaugural last lecture. You can see some of our previous last lectures in the program that they've handed out tonight. Also, I need to thank Dr. Robert Moore, Red Hawk, Jennifer again, and Larry Fugate, uh, who used to be with the pop-up commercial because they've taken a lot of time to make sure that this doesn't go an hour and a half, two hours. I'm sure you don't want to sit here that long. So, uh, finally, well, uh, finally, I need to thank the brothers of Talk Apeps so on coming out tonight. I do appreciate that. Um, if you, for those of y'all who aren't involved in the, the Greek organizations, they have uh, really built up. Finally, I, or I shouldn't say finally again, I publicly thank my wife, Tanya, uh, for putting up with me. It's often a thankless job, but she continues to do it. <laughs> I thank my mom, uh, Becky Sitton, who couldn't be here tonight because she's off at an Amaranth uh, thing, but she has kept pieces of me over the years and albums, and so it made it real easy to put this together. 
Also, I uh, need to thank Microsoft for providing PowerPoint app through Outlook Mail so that I can move to Linux without having to worry about Microsoft anymore after this year. And finally, I thank God for my life. If it ends tomorrow, I can't really complain. Ladies and gentlemen, you came here to hear stories, and I have stories to tell. However, I hesitate to use the word stories because most people think of that term as fiction. You won't hear any fiction tonight. Uh, sociologist Sterling Goffin once said that we frame things by emphasizing some facts over the others. Uh, North Carolina's Donald Shaw and Maxwell McCombs found that media actually end up highlighting certain aspects of things, uh, put things in a certain order such that they set an agenda. That is, they may not tell you what to think, but they're definitely telling you what to think about. Well, tonight, I'm practicing both framing and agenda setting. That is, I'm highlighting some points in my life over others, letting you see some things that shape the way I see me. Uh, trying to get 44 years into less than an hour has been a challenge, but it's good. Um, fair warning, I'm no preacher. Telling my story without mentioning God would be like making a peanut butter jelly sandwich without the peanut butter. So um, never begrudge a man his faith in God. We all assume we follow the right path, but we're all going on blind faith. So let me start. Last lecture, this education of redheaded stepchild. That term likely paints a picture in your head. How many of you have heard people like a redheaded stepchild in your life? It's not uncommon. <laughs> Uh, Answers.com claims carrot top step kids would be more disliked and bullied for their locks and beat more than a biological child. So what's it like being a ginger? What's it like being a stepchild? Well, lucky for you, I'm a Kodak kid. That is, I'm likely in the first generation to completely over-document a lifetime through photography. <laughs> As you can see, um, I, I've been many, many different shades of red over time, um, and that's not just my face. People take a lot of pictures of redheads. Sometimes it makes me feel like community property. Uh, Wikipedia, that fountain of collective knowledge, claims redheads comprise no more than 2% of the total population of the earth. The Urban Dictionary, however, notes a few divergent definitions of redhead. ones that really stick out to me. Uh, the condition of gingivitis is genetic and incurable. Gingers are thought to have those souls. Uh, typically redheads are artistic fierce fighters, great tolerance for pain. Famous ones include Van Gogh, Jefferson, Eric the Red, Stan Laurel. The ginger has freckles and pain, pale skin. I'm sorry, men typically love ginger women. A uh, ginger person has red hair. And apparently uh, people upset with some of the previous comments. I do like this one. Uh, the natural hair color ranges from rich auburn, pale blondish red, strawberry blonde, dark copper, fire engine red, flame red, bright orange, and so on. I actually had very copper hair whenever I was a child. It's kind of uh, lightened up, but it hasn't gone white yet. I'm, I'm waiting for that. That's the great thing about being a redhead. You're not supposed to go gray. You're just straight to white, and that's okay with me. Um, Ginger haired people are not queers or mutants. They're normal people. They have souls and lives. They're as interesting as anyone else. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, my mom was concerned about me because I came up to her and I told her I wanted to dye my hair black like my stepbrother. And she was just saying, well, you can't do that. And so she cut this uh, article out of the De Arkansas Democrat. Um, I've kept it over 20 years, so, you know, it's. Just to remind myself on occasion, it's okay. Uh, mom said I'm all right. But mom also warned me that folks would immediately believe I'm a bad man due to my copper hair and translucent skin flushing whether I'm out of breath, sneezing repeatedly, hitting a high note, ashamed, embarrassed, or even angry. The green blue Andrew's eyes flash behind that crimson glow, leading many to question my heritage while I slyly suggested I'm a leprechaun. Well, mom's genealogical pursuits have confirmed ancestors from Ireland, Scotland, Switzerland, Finland, Norway, the Netherlands, Bavaria, Prussia, Belgium, Germany, and England, with the healthy dose of French Huguenot tossed in for good measure. Yep, an all-American mutt. That's what some people call a marginal man. 
This guy is Robert Clark. He was a uh, journalist who became a sociologist. And I really like what he had to say here. The marginal man is a personality type, arising out of time and place where new societies, peoples, and cultures are coming to existence. Uh, inevitably, he becomes the individual with the wider horizon, the keener intelligence, the more detached and rational viewpoint. He's always the more civilized human being. He was actually talking not about redheads at that time. He was actually talking about multiracial Americans. However, I think if you're a cardinal in these days, you can, I can claim this. And so I, I do. Um, I haven't always been a redhead, or I've always been a redhead, but I haven't always been a sitting. Becky and Aaron Andrews, these two, brought me into the world on 19th, uh, November 16th, 1968. At Little Rock St. Vincent's Infirmary. My little sister, Ivana, over here, uh, joined us a couple of years later. My mother played piano, my father played bass. We all sing in choir. Uh, music runs through my entire history. My father attended Arkansas State University before graduating at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, my alma mater twice over. So uh, some of you may wonder, then why do I rise at commencement when they ask for first-generation college students to stand? Well, I'm going to get to that. Uh, my family moved to El Paso, Texas, where I tanned, bleached hair, bronzed skin for the only time in my life. Um, I also lost my dad there. I divorced seven of our family when I was about five. And I wasn't really ready to be the man of the house. I'd been around less than a decade when I first learned we cannot control what happens in our lives. We can only control how we respond to that. Mom framed it for me this way. Your father still loves you, he just has a funny way of showing it. Which, he still loves me anyway. Uh, we get along great now. I prayed a lot when my family broke up. But I also had some help. We moved next door to my grandparents, uh, Ronald, and, Ronald Macy and Edna May Macy, or as I knew them, Mom and Papa. Mom and Papa took me all over the Southeast uh, United States right after my parents broke up, trying to get my mind on something besides divorce. That trip sparked a passion for the road that proves divorce doesn't tarnish everything. We moved back to Landmark next door to my grandparents. Papa was a redhead, he wore khaki shorts, or as you can kind of see here, khaki shorts and a khaki uh, pants every single day except for Sunday, which at the time I thought was a little weird, but then I read about Einstein, I thought it was cool. Um, R.C. Macy taught me about onion and butter sandwiches. He taught me about fishing versus catching. But he also taught me about odds. He had this uh, flat bottom boat and on the front of it was this contraption that he made out of two by fours that was a half moon. And we ended up putting in all these cane poles into the 13 different holes which he had numbered. And we're, we're going across, and this was before they actually had limits on cropping, mind you. We're going across the uh, old river and the Corks start going down left and right. He's calling out numbers and I'm pulling cane poles and handing them back to him and he's handing me another one that's got a fresh man on it. And so he would come home with a load of crappie and if you've ever had uh, fish, crappie lays are the best there are. One afternoon while tying hooks, Papa taught me something I've never forgotten. That is, you can do a lot of things and make a lot of money, but if you don't love what you're doing, well, you shortchange two people. You shortchange your employer, you shortchange yourself. I don't know why at this age he felt the need to tell me this, but it's proven true as I have aged. You shortchange your employer because if you don't love your job, even if you're good at it, you'll never really work at it. If you're not working at it, you cannot get better. It's impossible. You shortchange yourself if you don't love your job because there will be days you don't want to go. If, you have, if you're always asking yourself, what if? Well, it's going to be hard to find happiness. You must love what you do because you continually need to educate yourself to stay with the times. Either you're continually learning or you're dead. Papa died Christmas Day when I was an undergraduate at ULR, but he's never really left me. He gave me unconditional love, which at that age, I needed more than anything else. What else could a soon to be redheaded stepchild me. Three times love. Once again, mom and papa, but 
And a lot of people mistook them for my, uh, my actual parents. They thought my mom was my sister because she kind of looks young. Uh, but up the top is high school and Maddie Sitton, also known as Nana and Papa to me. Papa was a, uh, well, he was an old school police officer back there in the bootlegging days up in, around Clinton and Marshall and Harrison, uh, which made Leroy second generation. Down here is uh, Arlie and Vivian Andrews, who uh, were my father's parents. And although we did not actually see a lot of each other after the divorce, they always were really great about you know keeping in touch and coming out to ball games when they could, and just showing me that you know just because the family wasn't exactly together didn't mean that they didn't love me. Um, I consider myself luckier than most stepchildren. A lot of people once they break their families, they just kind of split. That didn't happen to me. Um, I'm blessed because of that. Still, becoming a redheaded stepchild changed my world. I went from being the firstborn, living with two females, living next door to my grandparents, helping around the house, playing canasta, dominoes, paranoid age, monopoly, listening to Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Simon Garfunkel, Carol King. I went from that to being the youngest male at the house, uh, living with two males and two females, sometimes three males when my brother would come up from Crossing. Uh, living across town from the grandparents, but seeing my grandparents in Harrison almost as much or more. We would go up to Harrison once or twice a month, easy. Um, also, instead of helping around the house, I had chores, lots of chores. Uh, I played football, baseball, ran track, I listened to Kiss, and Journey, and Judas Priest, and Iron Maiden. Not exactly the same thing, but you know, you know, widen your horizons. Um, And it's all because of this guy. This is David Leroy Sitton whenever he was a kid. Um, he was a second generation cop. He ended up uh, becoming a corporal in the Arkansas State Police. That was uh, Papa whenever he was working for the highway, the highway police and that was just get, getting on the state police. Um, we melded this family together. And if I've done a decent job at all with my family as I've grown up and trying to meld their families together. It's because I kind of saw what happened here. Um, some of you found it odd that I would drive from Little Rock to Monticello to come down and teach and then go home on the weekends. And I did that for God, six years whenever I, when I first came down here. But uh, consider this. Dad drove back and forth from Little Rock to cross it to Harrison to cross it and back to Little Rock just so David and Chuck could see their grandparents. <coughs> Makes my drive seem uh, like a Sunday commute. It's not that big. I never went into the military primarily because I thought it was, I imagined it was a lot like living with Dad. Um, morning routines, afternoon chores, evening curfews. We ate pork flakes for breakfast and bologna and cheese sandwiches for lunch every day. Those are two things you will not find in my house. One, because my wife is vegan, but two, because I just won't eat either one of those. Um, Leroy was not afraid of spoiling a child. That is, he did not spare the rod. Time provides distance, and distance provides perspective. Looking back, I earned my share of whippings, as I always tended to learn things the hard way, even after I'd allegedly grown up. But Dad drew respect into us, so much that I unconsciously call people Mr. and Mrs. That is, cur using courtesy titles, even though the Associated Press style guide tells me, don't use courtesy titles, just use their last name. <laughs> and that will be fine. Um, he might not have been the most outwardly affectionate man, but he was never afraid to tell you he loved you. He taught me how to be a man, showed me I must take responsibility for my actions because there will be consequences for every action that you choose, or in some cases, actions that you don't choose. He never missed a chance to help his kids. He took care of each of us until the day he died on New Year's Eve a few years ago. I miss him quite a bit. Um, but folks, there's more than one way to gain an education. Papa, that is my mom's stepdad, who treated me as his, almost as a son, even though I wasn't even his blood. Papa graduated high school at 15, but he quit college to help his family. My father, Aaron, went to college Graduated, but at the same time, he lived more than 500 miles away in Atlanta when I was growing up. 
Mom took night classes but never finished. Leroy got about a semester under his belt at Arkansas Tech, but then he, where he met his first black man prior to escorting the Little Rock Nine into Central High. No one around me at the time I was going through school actually had finished what they had started when it came to college. Dad thought if I could get a state job with benefits, I'd be fine. After all, he, he had done it, his dad had done it, a lot of my family members have done it. And it is an honorable thing to do, working for the state. I, I did some time working for the state, we'll hit that in a minute. Um, but I always went back to school. I faced limbo after four different commencements, multiple jobs. I've gotten through by relying on what I know and being willing to continue learning. If you're in school now, realize you are making a foundation for the rest of your life. Not everybody gets that chance. Even if you sometimes find it boring, persistence provides the key. The more you put into anything, the more you're going to get out of it. And you can go anywhere in life. If high school is a department store of life, college provides a strip mall where you taste the variety of life and figure out what you want. Enjoy it, but realize nothing comes for free. Your real friends will, from this time will likely last you a lifetime. And we all keep friends, but we divide them into acquaintances, friends, and what I like to call family, that is, brothers and sisters by, or brothers and sisters by another mother. Um, friends help us see the good and the bad in ourselves, and thereby helping us improve. Friends tell us what we don't want to hear, but what we need to hear. This was my grades when I went to college the first time. Yeah, laugh at it, especially those of y'all who are looking at the great classes you're taking and say, oh, what did he say? I understand that. Uh, when I started college, we skipped class to go play pool at SOBs in downtown Little Rock. However, with the freedom to decide if you're going to class, I had to learn to understand nobody is going to hold your hand, nobody is going to force you to go, but if you don't go, you're only cheating yourself. If you pay for a concert, going to leave the money? Are you not going to use the ticket? Considering the amount of money you have going into your education, shouldn't you be camping outside the halls to be the first one to get in and take that exam? There will be nights that going out looks better than taking care of business. And sure, anybody can slack. A lot of folks don't have jobs right now because they slack instead of taking care of the business that they had an opportunity to do. That first year in college, I learned a lot about academic bureaucracy. I went from, an, I, as you can see, I withdrew from an honors composition course at the beginning of the semester. I had no idea you could do it in the middle of the semester, or I would have dropped that 8 o'clock class instead of just quit going. Um, that ended up giving me that first step, first one I'd ever had, in applied calculus. So I had to go back the next semester, and I had to take uh, where's that? College algebra. I, I did great in that. And so I was so smart that I thought I could just make my own schedule all the time. And I did. Because I was so smart, I did not need to talk to my advisor. Well, had I talked to my advisor, perhaps I would have realized that trying to take, and if you can see it up there, trying to take calculus one would not fix the F on my applied calculus. But, you know, I was smart. I knew everything. Probably did. Um, and that's kind of funny in that particular class. That class started with 30 people in it. The dean came back to teach after having not taught in over a decade. We started with 30. We ended with five taking the exam. Two people trying to get the A, one person doing their best to get the B, and me and this other cat just scraping by, hoping to God we would get that D, and it didn't happen. That's the great thing about being in college. That is, take advantage of making mistakes before you're held accountable for them. Now, I was held accountable as far as I ended up losing some money, but nobody went to jail, nobody died. It makes college beautiful. However, I am going to encourage you to make new mistakes. Repeating mistakes show stubbornness. Stubbornness, like whining, does not fix the problem, and it gets us no closer to a solution. 
you can channel that energy instead back into what we can do to fix things. What we can do to make things better. The more you learn now, the more work you put into that foundation I was talking about. The more you put in the foundation, the better you're going to be later. So read a lot. There are no shortcuts. If you think there's a shortcut, the only person you're shortchanging is yourself. I thought I had a shortcut because according to, I, I was the last high school class to come through the state of Arkansas that they allowed you to use two years of your high school foreign language instead of having to take foreign language in college. I've made it all the way to a doctorate and never had to take foreign language in college. Some of you are going, yeah, that's great. I'm thinking, man, I was stupid. Now, at the time, it, was, it seemed a good deal. Um, I wish I would have gone back and taken Spanish and nothing else, just because, folks, you're going to be talking a lot of it within the next 50 years. Seeing these grades could make you mad if you've taken some of my classes, especially uh, if you haven't seen my graduate studies. Seeing these grades should, though, show you that anybody can overcome a bad GPA if given time and showing enough persistence. I'll show you some more in just a second. But first off, let me show you what I was doing. Yeah. Singing in Carnegie Hall. <coughs> it was great. It was really great. Especially I was 21 and going to New York for the first time. The view here, it's really tough to see. I apologize for that. But that's looking out of the World Trade Center before the World Trade Center went down. We got to go there in 89. The next year, we ended up going to Mexico City, Puerto Vallarta, Guadalajara. God, I was having a great time. I will tell you, I can't, if we sat here and talked about all the things that happened on these trips, we'd be here for too long. But I can tell you that travel always teaches you about yourself. Things are the same everywhere. However, you're the one who changes from experience and the differences that can be found. You're not going to finish college if you're doing it for anybody but you. Let me repeat that. You're not going to finish college if you're doing it for anybody but you. If you're doing it for your parents, if you're doing it for your spouse, if you're doing it for your kids, if you're doing it for anybody but yourself, you will find a reason to quit. I know, I quit. I had this great little car idea. Uh, I met this beautiful girl named Tanya. She was only like 19 or so, and I was 21. All my friends wanted to know her relationship status. When I asked, she said she preferred redheads, which kind of blew me away. Tanya and I dated as kids, and then we broke up. And though I loved her, I lost her. However, we found each other later, which I'll get to later. Uh, that's, uh, I did have a song about it at this time of my life, though. The song is called Obsessions. I, was, I did not bring my harmonicas because of Oka on next Tuesday if you've got time, Oka Madness. But I did have this small little song. It's called Obsessions, and it goes like this. Woman was everything I ever wanted, everything my mom said she'd be. Lit up my life and scared me so. Must have been the right one for me. So I left. Carmen Gia was a cruising machine, but can hear you hop over tires, pull out system with hell hellish sound, made me conspicuous, hey look at me, so I wrecked. A life's worth living, I mean really good, job paying bucks, party all the time, friends, family, everyone around, my own place, my own life, so I quit. That's it. <laughs> That's a long way of saying, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. What's crazy in my personal life, craziness in my personal life, I apologize, because um, there was a lot of stuff I had to cut out just so we could stay with the time. Uh, I quit school. Mom taught me, or told me I was wrong for quitting school, told me I could not quit school, and I said, who's paying the bill? I was working three jobs at the time, bartending in one place, wait tables in another, making boxes about this long, about that big, Order to cremate people in for ten dollars on the table. I made a lot of money going not going to school. 
Mom tried to talk me out of it, like I said, but I decided to quit, and I went full-time with the highway department. I worked during the summers with these guys. Uh, this is actually over in Warren. We were standing on the side of the road, stopping people, asking where they're coming from, where they're going to. We were doing origin and destination surveys, finding out where are the traffic patterns, where do we need to move things to. Um, it was a good job. I gained experience with actual data collection. I traveled the state. Life seemed a lot better than going to school. I had no intention of returning to school. However, this guy, Greg Martin, he was 19 years old. I was 21. He was, uh, I was a crew chief. He was traveling with me. We split up our, our crew, and most of these guys went to, or came down to Warren, and Greg and I ended up going up to Springdale to do a commodity survey where you're trying to find out uh, where are the trucks carrying across the state lines. We had a blowout, or we had a flat on Wednesday, and we changed the tire to the spare that sat in the back of the pickup truck. Thursday morning, we started driving home. We came through Cole Hill on I-40, for those of y'all who know I-40, Eastern Arkansas. I'm sorry, Western Arkansas, let me get my place correct. Um, and at that time, the tire split, and we ended up going across, uh, we, I thought he had it, he got down into the median. I thought he had control of it, but uh, he didn't, and we ended up going into oncoming traffic. We missed hitting the tractor trailer rig head on, but um, when he moved to the right to hit the tractor, or miss the tractor trailer rig, the rim at that point, I guess the tire completely come off. The rim grabbed and threw us back into the car hauler, and it completely sheared off the driver's side, killing him instantly. And I got out with nothing but scars in my head. He was 19 years old. He was telling me how he didn't know how it was going to be to be an old man because he was going to turn 20 on Saturday. We buried him on his 20th birthday. You never know when your time is up. Life is short, so live it. I cannot explain being in front of you tonight without God's providence. I've written about it elsewhere. I'm not going to go into it a lot. If you want to read about it, I've got stuff for you to read. However, I do know that I was very jealous of Greg. Greg knew exactly what he wanted to do in life, and I did not. But his death gave, made me re-examine mine and gave me clues to what I needed to do, which brought me back to school. I hope it never takes someone else's death to help you figure it out. <clears throat> Needless to say, that kind of sparked me. And as you can see, uh, went through March 1991, spring classes. That accident happened in June, which made me come right back. With my mind right, I finished courses. I started knocking out things. Um, my GPA here, I'm trying to see if that was a decent semester. My last semester in college, I took 21 hours to get out. <laughs> Don't do it. That's crazy. If I, as an advisor, I would not let you do that. But I was doing it. And I talked my advisor, twisted his arm enough that he said, okay, you're ready to go. Let's get you. Um, I got out. Your degree is going to change your life, and it's going to change the life of everybody else around you. The day I earned my bachelor's degree, my relationship with my dad completely changed. I had taken his last name at the age of 19. It's kind of late to be adopted, for those of y'all who have been through it. However, I wanted to make sure that me and my sister could get adopted at the same time, and so I waited until she was able to make up her mind on her own so we didn't have to have my father's permission. We could just do it on our own. Leroy and Sitton raised me, and therefore, I, I don't know what it would be like to not be a Sitton, to be honest. However, until I earned that degree, he always found some reason to put me in my place and remind me what a dumbass I could be. After that, though, after I got that degree, I could do no wrong in that man's eyes, which is just as bad to me. Um, however, it's why I stand up for commencement. 
I was the first sitting in his line to earn a college degree. Dad was very proud of that. And he may have even taken more pride in that, in the fact that I got out without owing anybody a dime, took more pride in that than I took it in myself. Realize, nobody owes you anything. If you want something, you must get it yourself. If you're not paying for an education with your money, you're paying for an education with your time. If you're going to invest your time in this commitment, then you're going to get the worth out of it. But if you're not investing your time, then why waste the money? Couldn't you be doing something else? Folks, college isn't for everybody. But it can be for you if you want it. A university setting should be more than just the things you learn in class. It gives folks an opportunity to mold themselves into ladies and gentlemen if we do things correctly as instructors, if we do things correctly as advisors. At a university, we can think about things society would just as soon ignore. And we can change. And if we don't change, then have we really been educated? A college degree lures people with promises of making a million dollars more than someone who does not have a college degree. That's a lot of zeros. But I will say, be practical about it. Find something you love. Study it. Then even if you don't get the greatest job with the greatest salary, if you love what you're doing and you like going to work every day, folks, there could be worse things. And there often are. I determined to apply the journalism trade. I chose to work for my hometown newspaper, and my profession never claimed to pay high dollar. Instead, it provides satisfaction that writers might change the world if only they shine enough light on the world's hills. Wielding the pen's double-edged sword entails great ethical and legal quandaries if one truly wishes to be quote-unquote fair and balanced. I learned to cover every city government meeting I even got to write column. That's what the little thing up the top is. I honestly believe writers exist who put their community's needs before their own. I tried sticking with the times over a year while making less than poverty wages. I waited tables at the same time just to have some extra cash. However, after teaching my boss's replacement about the job, I decided it 